Well, good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we come together to worship the Lord our God today. A few announcements as we begin today. First of all, uh, just as a reminder, next Lord's Day morning at uh, 920, we'll be having mugs and muffins. So we invite everybody out for uh, our breakfast time there before Sabbath school uh, next Sunday at uh, 920. If you have any questions on that, uh, either uh, see me or see Miss Donna. Again, we invite everybody out for that. Also, um, we'll have session meeting night at five o'clock and also um, you know, be praying for our middle school kids as they come back from uh, the middle school retreat. Uh, we haven't heard much, so that's a good thing. Uh, so uh, give thanks to the Lord for the opportunity uh, that the kids have to go up Bon Clarkin. It's always a blessed time uh, of the year. Uh, so be in prayer for them. Also, uh, the Catawba uh, Elementary School retreat will be November 20th. And um, uh, I forget what time it starts, but uh, if you have any questions about that or you uh, have any uh, questions on it, just let me know and I'll be sure to get you to it. Uh, uh, sign up needs to happen by the 13th, uh, so uh, keep that in mind. But again, the elementary school retreat will be the 20th of November down at Terza. Also, I have on here, uh, just as a reminder, we're looking for a, a helper uh, for middle school uh, for Wednesday nights. So if you're interested in that, please uh, let me know or let Mr. Jimmy know. And of course, we invite everybody out for Wednesday night prayer meeting and for youth group at 6.30 on Wednesdays. If you have any questions on that, just let me know. Also, today we'll have our first practice for the uh, Lessons and Carol service uh, on the 12th of December. And we invite all kids to come out uh, for that practice today at uh, 4 o'clock. If you have any questions on that, please see Miss Jean. And as we uh, begin this morning... Let's go ahead and begin with a moment of silent prayer. Amen. As we're called to worship today, we do so again from the word of the living and the true God. As our call to worship today comes to us from Romans chapter 5. We read verses 6 through 9. Again, let us be called to worship by our sovereign and glorious God who has made this day for his people. Again, Romans chapter 5, beginning there at verse 6. Hear the word of the Lord. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. Thanks be God for the reading of his holy and his perfect word as he calls us again together to worship him, to give thanks for his grace, and to testify to our love to him. We come now to our opening hymn, hymn number 585. Let us stand as we sing from our red Trinity hymnals, 585.
What are the ways in which we testify to the fact that we have given our lives unto the Lord? Is that we are here today to worship, to give thanks, and to show again to the world that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we believe in the forgiveness of sins. And we believe in His glory and His grace. Let us come now before the Lord our God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, You are the great and the awesome God. You're the God who has watched over us from the moment of our conception even until the present moment. And dear God, we come before you as sinners, as sinners in need of grace and as sinners who have seen in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ an answer for the pain that is within us. And dear God, we pray in your mercy that as we think upon our own uh, misgivings and misdoings and, and everything that troubles us. That we will lay them at your feet on this day that you have made. That we will place all of our burdens on your back and that we will rest comfortably in your presence. And to God we pray in light again of this beautiful day that you've given to us. This day that we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That our hearts and our minds would look up unto the heavens and see the glory of our God. And let us come now saying the words that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we worship the Lord today, we go once more to his holy and his perfect word. As we read uh, in our scripture lesson today from Luke chapter 19. And as is our practice uh, when we are receiving a word from the Old Testament, we read here from the New Testament in our scripture lesson. And we continue to look here at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And today we'll be reading verses 41 through 48. Hear the word of the Lord. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I started up too early. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Four days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy and his perfect word. Please be seated. I want to invite children to come forward for a lesson today. Well, how's everybody doing this morning? Y'all doing all right? Y'all glad the, the cold weather's here? Yes. No? Yes. 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 <laughs> kind of mixed reviews on the, the change in the weather and all that. Now, there are good things that come with the cold, right? You know, we get fires in the fireplace and, you know, we start being able to have fires outside. And, you know, what's some of the stuff you like to do around fires? That's right, roast marshmallows, right, make, make uh, s'mores and all that kind of stuff. What else do you like to do? Roast a hot dog. Roast hot dogs? Um, re 
run around. That's right, run around the fire. You know, usually we get in trouble for that, but uh, that's something some people enjoy. Well, when we think about, right, this change of the season, where we start getting into the colder months, and we start seeing the leaves fall off the trees, and you, you start, uh, you know, just seeing some more of those kind of things, you know, maybe this year, you know, we'll be blessed with a little bit of white stuff that comes out of the sky. Would y'all like that? Yes, yeah, right. Y'all like a little bit of snow. Well, when we, when we think about, right, all these changes that happen, right, have you ever thought about why it is that God has given to us the fall? So that we can have a break from the summer. That's right. We can have a break from the summer, right? That's one of the reasons God gives it to us. But it also testifies to us something about the nature of the changes that have been brought to us by what we're going to read about in our scripture lesson today. Right? We're going to hear about the uh, curse that God has laid down upon the world because of Adam's sin. And one of the things that has come is death. And death is brought about because of Adam's sin. Now, the falling of the leaves and all this stuff remind us, again, that everything has a season. Everything has a time. And death is something that none of us can escape from. Unless the Lord comes back before we, before we die, it's, it, it's, it's a reality. But one of the reasons why it's important for us to remember that death is a real thing is because we come together on the Lord's Day morning, as you heard me say in the prayer, because of the resurrection. Right. Now, as anybody know, can anybody tell me what the resurrection is? That's right. It's when Jesus was raised from the dead, right? And we talk about Jesus' resurrection as the victory over death. And one of the things about being a Christian, about being a believer, is that we no longer are afraid of death, right? We're no longer afraid of the end of life because not only do we know that Jesus has won the victory over death, but where do we go when we die if we believe in Jesus? Um, That's right. We go to heaven. And we go to heaven and we live with him forever, right? There's joy and peace and comfort in this life knowing that death is not the end. But it's just the beginning of eternal life with our heavenly father. And so as you see the leaves fall and as you see the seasons change, remember, is it fall forever? No. No. Right? What comes after winter? Spring. Spring, right? And everything comes back out of the ground. Everything comes back alive. Right? And it's something to look forward to when it's dark and when it's cold and when, you know, sometimes it looks dreary outside, right? We remember that spring is in our future, just like in our life today. We remember that the future belongs to the Lord and the blessings are his. Right, Y'all ready to pray? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the goodness that you show to us. We especially give thanks that even in the darkest of days, we have the very light of Christ on our hearts and in our eyes. And may we rejoice and give thanks for that. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And one of the reasons why we can rejoice and give thanks and sing to the Lord is because of what we know about what the Lord has done for us. And so as we stand to sing Bible song number 284, we sing today a praises for the sovereignty of God, that the Lord has known us, the Lord has cared for us, and the Lord has provided for us his son, Jesus Christ. Let us stand as we sing together Bible song number 284.
stand before our Lord today, as we raise up our voices to the heavens, we do so again because we know that our God is sovereign and that he has blessed us in every way through his Son. Let us be seated. Well, as we now come before the Lord our God uh, to lift up the needs of our hearts and our lives before him, let us prepare ourselves for prayer. Let us pray. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God, again, who has watched over us uh, from the beginning even unto the end, the God who has in his perfect will called us to be his children. Unto you we gather together today to lift up our voices unto the heavens, to show forth our praise and thanksgiving for your grace unto sinners. That you, dear God, have had mercy upon us. That despite our unworthiness, despite our deserving your wrath and your judgment for sin, you have called us out of darkness to be your covenant people. You have called us not because we are more lovely or because we're wiser or because we're greater than anyone else. You have called us because you are a God of mercy and a God of love and a God of grace and a God who has, from before the foundation of the world, granted unto us the very name which is above every name. And while in history you have applied uh, those blessings upon our heart, some of us you call from the very beginnings of our lives. We can testify that there was not a day where we know not your name. Some of us you called in middle age, called us out of lives which were in rebellion against you. Others you have waited in your providence until they were in their older days. And dear God, no matter when it was that you circumcised our heart, when you gave us a new life in your Son, it was all in your blessed time and your blessed purpose. And dear God, we give thanks this morning that you have called us to be your people that you have in your blessed grace given unto us new hearts. You have redeemed us from death and shown us the light of your kingdom. And dear God, as we do think upon our own salvation this morning, as we do think upon and meditate upon what it is you have done for us, dear God, may you grow within us a heart of humility, a heart of thanksgiving, and a heart of obedience unto you. But dear God, you have called us not to remain in our sin. You've called us not to remain in our transgressions, but to be transformed. To no longer be conformed to this present evil world, but to be conformed unto your Son. God, we pray this morning as we do think upon our place in your kingdom that our assurance today will be founded upon that grace that you've shown to sinners. And that, dear God, our motivation to obey your commandments might be out of love unto you, out of thanksgiving for your grace. Dear God, may you move our hearts to take in your word into our hearts, into our minds, and into our lives. May we desire to feed upon you by faith. 
May we seek that your testimonies would be the very language of our heart. That when people saw us on the byways and in the highways, when they see us at work or in the store or in the car, wherever it is we might be, that we would be a witness unto you. That we would show mercy unto others. That we would turn the other cheek. That we would walk the second mile. But dear God, we do these things not because, again, we are seeking to bring honor upon ourselves, but because that is what our Savior has done. He has borne the wrath of the world, He has been spit upon, He has been beat, He has been reviled hated even by those whom he came to save. But he opened not his mouth and went as a lamb to the slaughter for our transgression, so that we no longer would be strangers to the covenant, but that we would be members of the family of God. Dear God, may you awaken our hearts and our minds to see these things more clearly that we might devote ourselves more and more to your work and to your kingdom. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray this morning as we seek forgiveness of our sins, dear God, we do pray that we would love our neighbor as ourselves, that we would love our enemies, that we would desire that those who are against us would come to know the peace of Jesus Christ that we would want for them what we have received ourselves. For there is no greater gift than Christ. And dear God, as we look out into the world around us today, we see the reality of a fallen world, of a world which is groping in the darkness, which knows not where to turn, and when it hears the name of the Lord, wants nothing to do with him. And dear God, as we look out unto our communities, uh, to our cities, to our county, our state, our nation, may we remember that we have been given the weapons to fight this war. And they are not the weapons of the flesh. They are not anger. And they are not hatred. But that they are the love of Christ and his mercy on the sinners. And dear God, may you move us to pray for those who hate us. May you motivate us to seek the forgiveness of sins in those who have sinned against us. No matter where they might be or no matter who they might, uh, no matter where they might live or, or who they might be. And we pray, dear God, that uh, this church, that Bethany, would be a witness to these truths. That as you give us opportunity uh, to share the gospel and the hope that is within us, that we would do so. That we, again, would lift up uh, those who persecute us. That we would pray for them daily. They would seek the intercession of the Holy Spirit in their lives whether they be in villages and towns in the Middle East, whether they be leaders of governments, wherever they might be, dear God, may you give us the wisdom to use your weapons of prayer and of the word. May we believe that prayer has the power that you say it does. May we pray in faith, in strength, and in assurance. But dear God, we also ask your judgment to be upon those who bring destruction upon your people. But we leave that judgment unto you. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we again are brought 
uh, to, uh, uh, even to tears by what we see around us. May we never lose hope. May we remember that we mourn and we have sorrow not like the world does. And dear God, may you renew within us and remind us today that this is not our home. That we are truly seeking after a better country. That our citizenship is in the heavenly places. And that we are not to walk in fear of this present evil world. But we are to be more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. May we stand strong in the face of evil. May we do so in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we bring these prayers before you today as we pray for our needs and the many unspoken prayers that we have. For we know that you are a God who hears the prayers of your people. For you are our God, as you were the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and as you continue to be their God, so too are you our God, both this day and forevermore. May we find peace and comfort in these things. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we come to the reading of God's word today and to the words which I would like to draw your attention comes to us from Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 through 19 as we continue to look here at the book of Genesis. Again Genesis 3 beginning there in verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. So the Lord God said to the serpent because you have done this you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You should not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the grace that you have shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you brought us to these words in your providence on this day, we pray that your Holy Spirit will apply these truths to our hearts. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we have walked through uh, this portion of God's Word, we have heard of how the world has come to be in the situation that it is. When we hear of wars and rumors of wars and we see reports of earthquakes, of tornadoes, of hurricanes, of uh, all sorts of evil things, the scriptures tell us where they came from. They came from Adam's decision to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All of it can be reduced to that very moment in time. And it's important for us again to remind ourselves of that truth. Eve did not cause the fall of the world. Adam did. 
And Adam did that because he was the covenant head. He was the one that God had made the covenant with in Genesis chapter 2, there in verse 15. Remember there it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And here we are seeing in chapter 3 the consequences of death. Of the death that God promised Adam would come upon the world if he disobeyed the very word of the living and the true God. It's one of the reasons why Adam's curse is last in the telling of the Lord. He begins with the curse uh, given unto the serpent, and the serpent, most especially, deserves judgment. Just because Adam is responsible doesn't mean that Satan gets a, gets a pass. And he is going to face judgment for his deceiving of the woman and of the man. And he is going, as we are told here, uh, be cursed. Uh, he's going to be on his belly. He's going to eat dust all the days of his life. Now, we hear that and we need to be reminded about something. Some say, well, obviously this couldn't have happened because snakes eat more than dirt. Uh, so this must be confused. Well, that's not really what the curse is, that snakes would eat dirt for the rest of their lives. I think all of us can testify that we have seen snakes eat all number of things that are not dirt. The idea here is, is that the snake, the serpent, Satan, is going to taste nothing but death for the rest of his existence. He is going to experience the fullness of God's wrath because of his deceiving of Adam and of Eve. And ultimately, we will see this come to pass in the book of Revelation in chapter 19 when he is thrown into the lake of fire where he will gnash his teeth forever. And the promise is laid bare here in Genesis 3. We need to be reminded that everything that happens after this is not in doubt. As if there is a question as to who's going to win the war. Genesis 3.15 tells us who wins the war. We're told here that the serpent will be destroyed. And who will destroy the serpent? But the seed of the woman. Hopefully, you know, most of y'all have heard this before, so it's not new information for you. But who is the seed that's spoken of here? Well, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the beauties of the book of Genesis is that we're going to see this word seed pop up over and over again. Now, the first seed that we're told of is Abel. And then another seed comes, Seth. And then another seed comes, and another seed comes, until ultimately we get Abram. And then we get Isaac. And we get Jacob. And then we get Jesse. And we get David. All the way down until Christ is born in a manger. Now, each of those seeds have a role to play in teaching us something about who Jesus Christ is and what he's going to do. But it's important to remember that every generation is reminded of the promise because the seed is born. This morning in Sabbath school, as we were looking at Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the things that we saw there is that the hope and comfort of Israel as they went into the land of promise was the fact that the Lord God is one. The great Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4. But what was the context of that? The context of that was the promise which was made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And what was that promise? Again, it summarized there for us that the Lord our God is one. 
That the Lord our God, who made a promise, who made a covenant here in Genesis 3.15 with the seed, would be the one who would provide for his people from generation to generation. And that they who lived in these days were to remember the promises of God. And that just as the promise came to pass, that if Adam ate of the fruit that he would die, so too the promise that we see here that out of the seed would come the crushing of the head of the serpent, that is going to come true. As I was talking to the kids, one of the blessings of death is that it reminds us that death is not the end of all things. Remember what the Apostle Paul says, right? We mourn not as those who have no hope. When we are staring at an open grave and we're placing a loved one in it, what are we doing? We are placing them in the ground because we believe in the resurrection. We believe that even though Satan is going to eat death for his all existence, we are not. Even though we bear the curse of death because of Adam's sin, that is not the end of the story for a believer. And that's one of the things that we're meant to see here in Genesis chapter 3. Yes, there are great consequences which come to reality because of Adam's sin. But that is not the end of the story. And in fact, the very pain and anguish of childbirth, we're told, is a blessing. Because after you go through that, what do you have? You have a child. You have a culmination of a promise. And the, and the promise grows up. And the promise is with you. It's a picture that Jesus draws for us later on in the gospel as he testifies to these things. Now, unfortunately, the reality of the curse is that there will be sorrow in childhood. And death will sometimes be the reality of childbirth. But what is the hope that we have even in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of death, even in the womb? Right? The, the hope that we have, even in the midst of the curse, is that the Lord our God redeems all things. That even though there is this consequence of the curse that even invades the womb, the promise we have again is that the Lord our God is sovereign even over these things. Even out of the darkness of moments, in which you lose a child, the promise is, who has their hand on that child? The Lord does. And that's part of the promise, the hope that we have here in Genesis chapter 3. Is that even in the midst of the darkness and all of the consequences, which we'll get into here in a moment, we read these verses as those who know the end of the story. As those who see in the promise of the seed the ultimate truth which comes out of Adam's curse. That that curse is not forever upon the people of God. That, that curse has already been fulfilled, already been taken care of in the promise of Genesis 3.15. I will put enemies between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right? This battle that wages between the church and the devil is ongoing. But remember something that we see throughout the scriptures. How many times does the devil win over the church? Right? The church is undefeated against Satan. No matter how many times he seems like he's getting the upper hand, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ always prevails. We see this beautifully laid out for us in the book of Revelation when the, uh, you know, the, 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 with the dragon who is chasing the baby and the woman in the wilderness, right? He, he spews out all that water to drown them and what happens, right? The earth opens up and all the water gets swallowed up and the woman and the baby are protected. And why is that? Because again, the Lord God 
has already established the victor of the story. The victor of the story is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we in him. And that is the eternal promise we have laid out for us in this passage. And it must again be on our mind as we think about some of the consequences of these curses. We've talked about how the serpent will be more cursed than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. Right? He'll be on his belly and he will eat dust all the days of your life. Right? He'll eat death. He'll experience nothing but death and nothing but pain and anguish for as long as he is on this earth. And then ultimately, what will happen? Right? He'll be in the lake of fire. Well, eternally, he will taste death. Right? That is his punishment for the deception. But then, again, uh, we are told in verse 16 of the curse upon the woman. And we'll talk about that now. The curse in verse 16 says, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, again, we need to be a little careful, and we need to you know, speak where Scripture speaks here. Ladies, it is not a curse for you to love your husband. Right? That's not what desire means here. Right? The desire that is spoken of here is the way in which that desire is perverted by sin. And the same thing could be said of men towards women. Right? The whole relationship between men and women is broken by the curse. The desire that a woman is to have for her husband is again perverted by what has taken place here. Now, one of the ways in which that is perverted in the scriptures is that the woman desires to rule over the husband. Right? The, the order of things is broken. It's one of the reasons why, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as well as in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul, as he is kind of reorganizing things, reminds both women and men that there is a creation order to things. That the reason why, for instance, in 1 Timothy 2, we are told that women are not to have authority over men in the church is because Adam was made before Eve. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter uh, 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 10 and 11 there, as it's laid out, why is things ordered the way they're supposed to? Because again, Adam was made first, then Eve. Now, What's the problem here? What, what, what exactly is the, the point of all that? What is the problem with women being in charge, for example, in the church? Well, again, it goes back to the statement that's made there about how God has ordered all things. Does that mean women are to be secondary citizens in the kingdom? That they are to be less than than men? Well, of course not. Right? That's not the purpose of the way in which God has ordered his kingdom. And it's not a statement of value in the eyes of the Lord. But again, we see here something about how the, 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 the relationships have been destroyed, have been broken by the entrance of sin. And the desire should be one of servanthood towards the husband. Right? One should be, as it's laid out by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, right? what is the relationship there? Right, Christ is the head, right? And the husband is the head. But how is, again, the husband to lead in the home in a created, ordered marriage, right? He is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. And the, the wife in that situation, what is she to do but to serve her husband and to see to it that the household is ordered in accordance with the wisdom and the purpose of the Lord. But if everybody's in charge, what happens? Nobody's in charge. Right? If everybody's a chief, right? I probably shouldn't use that expression anymore, but if everybody's a chief, right? nobody's an Indian. Right? There, there is a order to the way that God has established his creation and our kingdom should reflect 
not how the world has been perverted, but how God has established things before the entrance of sin. And so this curse that we see laid down here, this desire to be for your husband, is not, again, the testimony that you should love your husband, obviously you should, but that you desire to be your husband. And that's one of the things that we see in the, in the fallenness of the world today. You know, it, it's fascinating to me that in the, all the transgender stuff that's happening now, you, what's one of the things that they tell you uh, to look for in your children to see whether or not they're transgendered or not? Right? If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if your son likes playing with dolls, what does that mean? He must want to be a woman, right? Well, obviously that's nonsense. But think about the, 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 just the, the idiocy of that, right? The same people who deny that there are gender-specific things want to tell you that if your son likes to play with dolls, that means he wants to be a woman. Now, is there anything feminine about playing with dolls? No, right? How many of you played with G.I. Joes when you were a kid? Right? How many of you played with... Uh, you know, army men and things like that. Now, what are those things? Right, they're dolls, right? They're fundamentally the exact same thing. Now, we like to tell ourselves that, well, those are manly things, right? They're different, but really they're not, right? And so fundamentally what we see here in the, in the brokenness of the way the world thinks today is that they know in their head that there is a difference between men and women. And they don't know how to deal with that, so they try again, instead of blessing the uniqueness of men and women, they try to make everybody a man. But that's not what the Bible has taught us. Right? God has made us male and female for a reason. Because the best man is a man. The best woman is a woman. And we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ need to trust in the distinctives of being a man and being a woman. And one of the ways in which we do that is by, again, recognizing the wisdom of how God has ordered the family and how God has ordered society. But that is what sin has done. It has cursed, it has destroyed the uniqueness of being a man and of being a woman. It has confused all of these things. And so if you want to be a godly woman, what should you want to be? A woman. You should not desire to, to do what men do, to have the roles that men do. Likewise, if you are a man, what should you desire? Should you desire to be a woman? To take on uh, you know, you know, female roles and female responsibilities? Well, if you're doing that, what's not getting done? Right? The man's stuff's not getting taken care of, and the woman's stuff is not getting taken care of. And so it introduces all kinds of confusion into the family. And the family is the building block of society. It's the building block of how we are to see, again, the blessings which come from these things. You know, when the Lord God made male and female, what did he tell them to do? He told them to multiply. And part of that multiplication was so that the whole world would come under dominion of the family. And if the family is disordered, what's not getting taken care of, right? The, the, the world is not getting taken care of. And so there is multiple different ways in which we see this destruction happening, not just today, but we've seen it throughout history. It's not accidental that the Roman Empire began to uh, make all kinds of uh, you know, confusions amongst gender responsibilities and led to its destruction, its downfall. And we're saying the same thing today. But if we cannot get the basics right, then there's no way we're going to get the more complicated stuff taken care of. And it all begins here in the way that confusion reigns amongst the responsibilities of men and women. And the church has to be the place 
where we model for the world what that means. And so we need to be careful that if we are a man, that we are we are, we are uh, forming our understanding of manhood not based upon you know, television and the culture, but upon what the very word of the living God has testified to us a man should be. And what's the primary thing that a man should be? A primary thing a man should be is a lover of the Lord our God. A man should be leading his home in the righteous things of the Lord. It's part of their, their, their role as the head of household. Right? If you're in charge of a business, if you're in charge of, of anything, where does the buck stop? It stops with you. So if things are disordered in your home, if your children aren't walking with the Lord, well, it begins at the head. Right? And the head has to take not only responsibility for that, but the head needs to take the responsibility to go after those who are wandering and bring them back into the household of the Lord. And we see this not only in the family, but in the church itself. Right? Who should be watching over the church? Right? Those who have been authorized by the Lord God to do that work. And if the church is disordered, who is responsible for that? Well, again, the head, those who have been put in charge of that. And so if things are disordered, who needs to order things? Well, in a Presbyterian church, right, that is uh, in the session with the elders of the church. And it stops with me. Because who's been given the authority to proclaim the word of the Lord and to teach the people what God has declared? That's my job. And so as we think about, again, the way that God is redeeming his church, as he's redeeming the family, as he's redeeming society, well, it begins right here in the pulpit. And that's one of the reasons why we have seen such confusion in the world today is because the pulpit ceased to proclaim the word of God. Because the pulpit started proclaiming what men and women wanted to hear. And we're afraid what the world might think of them if they did that. Or didn't do that in this case. And so, one of the things we need to think about in the context of Genesis chapter 3, as we apply this to ourselves, as we see the curses that are laid down upon Adam and upon Eve, is we need to take stock of our own understanding of our role in the kingdom. You know, are we seeking to be men molded by the picture that is laid out for us in the word of God? Are we seeking to be women as God has laid out uh, us, to, not us, but laid, laid y'all out to be? Again, I say this all the time, but it's true. This isn't rocket science. The problem is what? The problem is we don't like it. And so we, 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 we try to come up with all kinds of ways to nuance the straight teaching of the Word of God. You know, we, we love to talk about grace, but how good are we at showing grace to others? Right, we love to talk about the mercy of God upon our souls, but do we show mercy to those who have sinned against us? And, I, and you know, it goes for me as much as anyone else. And so if we want to see the curse reversed, if we want to deal with the consequences as they're laid out for us here in Genesis 3, well, we again need to begin in our own hearts. Right, Reformation, revival begins with the people of the Lord. It doesn't do us any good to stand up here and castigate the Democrats and all the evil people in the world and talk about how much better we are than them. Because that's what the Pharisees do. Right? That's, what, that's, that, that's what the Pharisees did in the days of Christ. They were glad that God had not made them like these sinners over here. Remember, who does Jesus 
commend to us in the Gospel of Luke. Right? The, 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 the publican who bowed his knees, put his face on the ground, and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we have to be willing to be honest with ourselves. We have to be willing to deal with our own sin. Because if our lives are not ordered in accordance with the scriptures, it doesn't do us any good to point out the, 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 the speck in the people across the street. Or the people down the road or the people on TV. Right? Nancy Pelosi is as wicked as it comes, but I don't know her. I can pray for her, but I don't know the time I'm going to have to have her sit here and proclaim the word of God to her. I hope somebody is. I hope somebody is proclaiming to her the need for, 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 for salvation. The reality is, is that right, the Lord has granted us opportunities to gather together to deal with our own struggles. And he's given us not just the Lord's Day morning because, again, it's hard for me to do everything that I need to do in 30 minutes or 35 minutes, depending on how long I go today. Right? We need to be gathering together to do these things. Right? We need to be fellowshipping with one another. We need to be praying with one another. And we need to be taking time to do that. Now, I know this is kind of self-serving, but... You, know, you think about how you order your time. Right? What takes priority? Is it your own walk with Christ? Is it the, 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 the need that you have to bear one another's burdens? Or does all the things of the world take precedence over the things of the Spirit? One of the things that we see here in the book of Genesis is that when the world takes precedence, what happens to the family of God? God made a promise to Abraham that he would provide him a seed. And what did Abraham do? Abraham got impatient. And he was waiting on Isaac to come and he didn't want to wait any longer. So he and Sarah concocted a plan that, hey, go sleep with my concubine. Well, how'd that work out? We got Ishmael and all the troubles that come with it. If Abraham had been faithful to the Lord, had remembered what the Lord had said, then we'd have Isaac and we'd not have to worry about all the nonsense that came out of Ishmael. When we make use of what the Lord has provided for us, then we'll be blessed in that. And so as we close our time this morning, as we think about, again, the consequences of sin, as we think about the realities of what has happened because Adam ate in the garden, because what Adam has done in throwing all of the world into confusion and into uh, divisiveness and all these wicked things that sin does to people, remember something that Paul has laid out for us in Romans 8. For we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together. One of the last two words of that verse? Until now. Well, what, what do you mean? Creation groans and it labors with birth pangs until now. Well, what has happened? Right, the Lord Jesus Christ has come. What has the Lord Jesus Christ come to do? The Lord Jesus Christ has come to redeem the world. The Lord Jesus Christ has come to put back into order that which is disorder. He has come to bring salvation to the ungodly. He has come to bring peace to those who do not know peace. Brothers and sisters, as we Again, close this morning as we think about, again, what that means. Do we know the Lord's peace? Is the Lord's peace something that just kind of exists up here in our heads? Something we've heard about? Something we can, re can, we can repeat? Is it something that we know in our hearts? Is it something that we have an experimental relationship with? That's something that we know about in the depths of our hearts that we have been redeemed in Christ. 
Now having been redeemed in Christ, we no longer love the things of the world. We no longer operate according to the dictates of the world, of the way that the world understands things. We're no longer conformed to this present evil world, but we are conformed to Jesus Christ. Is it true of our hearts and of our lives? If it's not true, right? If you've only been saved kind of in an intellectual way of knowing the mechanics of salvation, well, that's not going to do it. What is necessary is, again, this being made new in him. Of seeing with new eyes and a new heart and a new mind and desiring not the works of the flesh, the works of the Spirit. When you read the law of God, do you rejoice or do you feel a burden? Remember what has happened to us. For Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The curse has been removed for you in Christ. You no longer have the burden of sin on your heart. You have the peace of the gospel. Rest in that today. But rest in that in a way that shows forth the fruit of of that thing. Remember what Jesus did with that fig tree that he saw on the road? Didn't have any fruit on it. What did he do to it? Cursed it. Consider that today as you think about the work that Christ has done for you. Are you bearing fruit for the Lord? Or is this just an exercise that we have to do every day? The question that we have to ask ourselves because eternity is a long time. Do we believe in the Lord for salvation, for redemption, for eternal life and blessings in him? This must be true of us if we have hope in this life, both this day and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the goodness of your grace and for the truth that you have laid forth on our hearts through your Holy Spirit. And to God, may we remember uh, the goodness again of your blessing, that you are our God and we are your people, and you have called us unto yourself, both this day and forevermore. And in his name we pray. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our closing Bible song, Bible song number uh, 247, Better to Trust in the Lord. Let us stand and sing together, 247 verses 1 through 4.
close at our time uh, this morning in worship. Again, we uh, seek the Lord's peace and his comfort. And again, if you have need to speak unto me or to any of the elders, we are here to serve and to be here for you. And we come now to the benediction today, which comes to us from Jeremiah 17, verses 7 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he should be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Amen.